Hello, and welcome to Bridging the Gap, the interview series that brings together leaders in healthcare to discuss the latest innova innovations impacting behavioral health. I'm Chris Malaro, co-founder and CEO of Neuroflow. I'm so excited to have um, our guest today on the podcast, in particular because I'm close. Uh, it's close to a topic. Uh, it's on a topic close to my heart in suicide prevention, particularly veteran suicide prevention. Uh, I think for our listeners and people that are familiar with Neuroflow, they know I'm an Army veteran. Um, and a large part of why I got started with Neuroflow was because of losing friends and soldiers to suicide. Um, veterans particularly struggle with suicide at a significantly higher rate than uh, non-veteran citizens. Uh, what stood out to me, too, was... Uh, women veterans um, struggle with suicide rates, I think, 2x more than non-women veterans, which which stood out to me. Um, so this might be a gloomy conversation at times, but I also think it's going to be a good conversation because there's a lot of innovation in the area. We're making a lot of impact. Um, and so today, to discuss this with me, I'm honored to welcome the former executive director of the Suicide Prevention Office at the VA. Yeah, that's the whole VA, the executive director, which is phenomenal, and the current vice president at Red Duke Strategies, Dr. Caitlin Thompson. Welcome. Thank you, Chris. It's so good to be here. I'm really, really thrilled to talk about this. It's such an important topic, and as you said, it's, it's a difficult topic to discuss, but there's also so much hope and... Um, and especially with uh, with the innovation innovations that are happening right now. So on the, I guess diving into suicide, which is not a happy topic in and of itself. Yeah. Um, we at the company try to get everybody certified in mental health first aid and how to deal with suicide ideation. And if not, we're struggling with it. If friends or family members or coworkers are, and one of the things that we learned on how to deal with it is, don't beat around the bush. Yeah. Don't ask questions like, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Or yep. are you going to do something that regrets? But are you thinking about killing yourself? Yep. Yeah. It's so, yes. I, I am so glad that you're uh, insisting that your, that your uh, employees do this. I wish other, other uh, organizations did. And yeah. I highly encourage others to. It's great. It's free too. It's, it's totally free. free. Resource. Yes, it's awesome. It is. It's fantastic. And it does, it gets right to the point. Um, there are so many myths about asking people about suicide. You know, there's this idea that if I ask somebody if they're thinking about killing themselves, then I'm going to put it in their head, and then they're going to go home and and kill themselves, and it's going to be my fault. And there's been research that has shown really the opposite, which is opening up that conversation allows those people to really free, more freely talk about how they're feeling right. in a way where they sh where you're showing you're not scared of this. So even by saying like, are you thinking of hurting yourself? Is It's almost showing that you're a little scared to ask what the real question is, right. which is, listen, I am worried about you. you know, have you been thinking about taking your life? Have you been thinking about killing yourself, getting right to it? Which can be hard sometimes. I it's myself, very hard. It's awkward yeah. even just to say it. It's, it it yeah. can be, yeah. So another thing that I always encourage uh, organizations to do is have like, you know, maybe every couple of months have a lunch and learn where you're actually practicing using that language with your colleagues so that when the time comes up, it's a much more easy thing to ask. Or it's, it's not easy, but a much more um, natural thing to ask than, than you would otherwise. Um, because people who are suicidal who then want to talk about how they're feeling are going to be able to just open up so much, so much more. And suicide, my understanding, is not, it's not a uh, binary thing. Right? It's not Correct. like you're going to kill yourself or not. There's a spectrum of severity. Can you speak to that? Yeah, for sure. Yep. I mean, th so the way that we think about suicide is it's um, it's on a continuum in many ways. Um, there are millions of people each year who think about suicide, mm -hmm. which is uh, what we call suicidal ideation, where we think about it, um, we might think about you, a plan, we might think about whether or not somebody has uh, intent, they, whether they intend to do it. Um, Thinking about it could be as easy as like, man, life sucks right now, yeah. and I just... I wonder what it would be not to be here anymore. Completely, completely, which is a horrible feeling. And right. so, um, and most people who think about that don't end up dying by suicide. Right. Um, but uh, you do definitely want to acknowledge and recognize that, that 
that's not great a great feeling to have in any way. 100%. So one thing that I, I also love about what you all do at Neuroflow and what other organizations are doing is it's getting to people faster so that even if they're just thinking that it's getting up what we call upstream and it's an upstream intervention it's getting to um, getting to the point before they become in crisis and before mm -hmm. they really have have um, have gotten so so depressed or so um, feeling so worthless that they finally end up uh, attempting suicide and then um, and then if the attempt is um, successful, which I hate that word, but if the attempt uh, it becomes a suicide, then then that's the end. That's the last part of that right. continuum. And it's just, I mean, I, this goes without saying, but it's such a tragedy because it's a permanent solution yes. to a what, in many cases, is a temporary problem. It it really is. And one thing that we have to remember is that people who are so uh, who are so close to dying by suicide they feel that they are out of options. Mm -hmm. And their perspective is very screwed up. Mm -hmm. uh, they are thinking, nobody loves me, you know, or this is the only way out. Whereas, you know, it, it, whereas with most people, you would say, oh, wait, I, I'm not going to do this. I mm -hmm. have family that loves me. I would be, you know, leaving these, you know, leaving my children or whomever. Um, and so it isn't that, People are. Some people say, "Well, it's, it's a very selfish act." It isn't that at all, because mm. your perspective is just so screwed up that you aren't thinking clearly. Right. And then you eventually, you know. It's un interesting you say that. I remember when I was a kid, like maybe at f 10, 11 years old, and I forget who, but some celebrity um, completed suicide. Yeah. And it was in the news, and we were talking about it. And I remember very explicitly, my friend's dad. Mm -hmm said, oh, that's so selfish. Yeah. I can't believe, like, how how dare they sort of thing. And yeah. um, and I, in a positive way, I think that mentality has been shifting and the understanding has been changing. I don't know. It, you're saying that it's, it's actually not a selfish act. We just have no even understanding of what that person is thinking. Absolutely. Yes, right? exactly. I mean, they are at the end of their end of their rope in many ways, and their brain is telling them, you know what, this is an option for you. Mm -hmm. um, and so... It, it, you know, if if they didn't die by suicide, many people will look back on that time and say, I have no idea what I was thinking. Right. I can't believe that I would have thought that I would have gotten that far. But it happens. And so that's why we need to have the types of um, interventions and the types of crisis, yeah. you know, interventions that we have. Now, the... You're obviously a clinical psychologist. Yes. Um, you're an authority on this subject. I mean, you... Specifically for mm -hmm. veterans... You've worked pretty much your entire career at the VA? I have. Before at Red Duke? Yes. Yep, yeah. Yep. I, uh, How does that work? Can you talk to us about the experience? I mean, working in the largest healthcare system in the world, effectively, yep. with a very unique population. Yeah. Just can you walk us through your experience there? Absolutely. Yeah. I had no idea that I would be doing this type of work when I went to graduate school. Um, in graduate school, I went to the University of Virginia, for uh, got my PhD there. Um, and I worked specifically with um, maximum security women inmates, and I was helping with uh, parenting and uh, parenting classes and just, um, you know, just uh, uh, supporting these women who were, you know, extraordinary and very complicated and very dangerous. And there, it was just so much going on with this group, and there was so much trauma related to yeah. to the group. And so um, I became very interested in trauma. And so uh, when I was looking for to do internships uh, for graduate school, um, after grad school, then I only, I decided, you know what, I don't have many veterans in my family. I really don't know the VA system. Why don't I just try for VAs? And I ended up at the Denver VA Medical Center. That's where I matched. And um, really within, within, I would say, days of going in there and really just being surrounded by these extraordinary men and women um, who have done so much for us. Yeah. Um, I was like, this This feels right. Like, this is, I think this is my thing. Right. And it absolutely was. What happened, though, Chris, is that after that first year uh, of being at, at the Denver VA, there were three veterans who I worked with at to various levels during that year who died by suicide. Ugh. 
and it rocked my world in my thinking about what I wanted to do with my Did life. Did you know them as the as patients? I knew them as patients, yeah. I mean, wow. they weren't like close because, you know, one I worked with for a week while he was in an inpatient unit. Another I worked with in a, a, um, a, a substance abuse group. Right. Uh, and another in another capacity, but um, uh, I had thought that I was going to go and I was going to be a clinician and I was going to be with people and sit with them and you know for my whole life. And in fact, um, that experience made me rethink everything. Um, and I then, instead of being a clinician, I haven't done clinical work. Uh, in since graduate school. Really? Yeah, yeah. So and that just set you on a whole new trajectory. Set me on a whole new trajectory because it just so happened that the Denver VA also had a brand new postdoctoral program in suicide prevention for veterans. Huh. And so it was a research opportunity, and so I was accepted to the to that fellowship. Um, and it was, you know, this was in 2007, so this was mostly still, you know, the older veteran population, but yeah. now the newer post 911 folks yeah. were coming in. Wow. So, um so dealing with both like uh, I guess long-standing trauma from maybe Vietnam era to new trauma with younger veterans. Completely. And what's always interesting to me too is I've gotten to know the field more and more because then from there then I worked at the Veterans Crisis Line for almost 5 years. Really? I oversaw um, most of their clinical work. Uh, when I started, there were 40 uh, people on the call line, and there are now over a thousand. So yeah. um, that was that was amazing uh, work, and then ended up getting these leadership positions and more policy-driven work. But um, but the thing about the trauma too is um, the that we also have to remember those veterans who have never even deployed. Right. And some of the research that's come out has shown that, in fact, veterans who haven't deployed or, um, you know, haven't maybe even more suicidal than those who have, which kind of goes against our thinking, right? Yeah. Because one has... Is it this, like survivor's guilt, maybe? Or? I think a lot of it is that. I think a lot of it is that lack of tribe, that lack mm -hmm. of kind of group and, and mission. Right. Um, but like I didn't earn it or something exactly, like that. Exactly, yeah. It's I mean, there are people, there are veterans who I still talk with who say, uh, yeah, I was a veteran for three years, but uh, I didn't go anywhere, and so I don't feel like I deserve huh. VA care. And this then ties in with that the statistic that 40% of veterans who die by suicide haven't touched VA care. I was going to say, like the because most people at the v, the VA is like one of the places that whenever something goes right, yeah, it's okay. It's the way it should be. When something goes wrong, they make front line page news. Yes. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that's positive is that if they're getting care at the VA, there it's a lower risk, right? Correct. You are you are really being being wrapped around by the services there, the integrated services, um, and the people who work in particularly in the suicide prevention field. There are just extraordinary, extraordinary people. So. Um, so then the question is, how do we get to those who don't have right. the VA, who don't use VA care? Um, and that's, I think, a bigger question. And that's one where I think innovation can really help right. and come in. To play. The, okay, so not to be a downer on the VA, but the, mm -hmm. I'm sure you're familiar with some of the stories about, um, you know, I think the VA is interesting because it is a compilation of people like you and others that are mission driven, want to really want to do well mm -hmm. to veterans and to the, their communities. But sometimes the bureaucracy gets in the way. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, we could look up the story to know the specifics, but I think there's a few cases of examples of veterans getting turned away. Mm -hmm. And I remember in Long Island, there was one veteran that came mm -hmm. in, asked mm -hmm. for mental mm -hmm. health support, was mm -hmm. turned away, and shot himself in the parking lot of the VA. Like, yeah. the... It's a, it's it's frustrating to hear that story. It's devastating. Yeah, absolutely. And I have been very heartened how the VA is also now. You know, they just opened up emergency services for really any veteran who has a mental health problem. That it's are, amazing. That's free, so the people can walk into the front door. And I believe they've seen over fifty thousand veterans that way, just since it started maybe a year or so ago. And so I, I feel the thing with VA is yes, there's you know there's layers, there's bureaucracy, um, and we're there we're fighting we, they and um, 
we, me as a contractor with VA, is continuing to fight to, um, to, to lessen those barriers and has made some really important strides. And I think that that's yeah. one in particular. But yes, there are some devastating stories uh, that, are, that are out there. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it, sh- it shows how much also we need to be educating everybody around mental health first aid. You know, if mm-hmm. there's somebody, the, even the parking garage attendant exactly. should be able to walk up to somebody who they see might be in danger and feel comfortable enough mm-hmm. To ask them how they're doing. So now you're telling me, so as a veteran, and every, people don't know this, but not every veteran has access to VA Correct. services. But yep. if I was a veteran that didn't have access to VA services and I was still in a crisis, Correct. I could go to a VA and get help. That's that's my understanding, yeah, of that. That's of remarkable. That program. It is. It's it's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. The why? So. One and a half. What's the rate for veteran suicide compared to non-veteran suicide? It's about one and a half times more. Yes. Right. Thank you. Like why? Like what are the? Re- I'm sure that it depends, and that there's a lot of theories. But what's sure. what's your professional opinion? Yeah, I mean, it's it continues to be a question that we continue to wrangle with um, because we know that there's never just one reason why somebody um, is thinking about suicide. There is, um, you know, there is data out there that's showing that uh, that uh, substance abuse um, in veterans can be higher in many ways, and that could, that very much can contribute to suicide, yeah. suicidal thoughts. Another huge, huge thing is firearms and uh, guns, and that is um, that's another step that VA is taking. I think beautifully uh, in a way that I was not able to when I was there yeah. over seven or so years ago, um, we weren't allowed to even talk about guns um, because there was so much concern around the political ramifications of it. Oh, interesting. And yeah. um, it's like stay off that topic. Don't, yeah, don't yeah. you can't you can't talk <laughs> about it. And, and we were, and we would say and we still say, well, we have to. This yeah. is you know the number of veterans who own guns is. Uh, far far greater than than uh, non veterans. Is that the number one cause of veteran suicide? It is. It is. It's far greater than half, and that's far different from the non veteran population. And as we all know, when you use a gun, when you're feeling suicidal, you know there's over ninety percent chance you're going to die. Right. As opposed to other ways. Right. So you know the VA has done, as I said, a beautiful job with um, you know their gun locks available. They're trying to get incredible like messaging out there that's that's just very kind of pointed and you know ask your friends about your guns. Nobody is trying to take away guns unless somebody is in a crisis, right. and it isn't taking them away. It's taking them away for the time of the crisis. Right. Because so you stabilize the situation. So you stabilize the situation. Um, and then you can move on from there. Now, the someone would, maybe someone that's a skeptic would say, mm-hmm. okay, a gun lock, but if I'm, I could just unlock it mm-hmm. and then use the gun. <laughs> like, so how do you? Yeah, for sure. But there's still that time and space is what they talk about. There's still that period between having to go find the, the key, going to the gun, Op, you know, opening the lock, and yeah, that is, you know, gun safes are are perhaps better. Moving the ammunition and the and the firearm into very separate parts of your property, um, but each of those things allow for the time and space for something to ha- something else to happen. 